on today's episode of Mile Higher. Not knowing what happened to your loved one is just the worst thing ever. The sheer amount of people that disappear in this geographical region is honestly shocking. We are talking about the disappearance of Matthew Weaver Jr. I would probably think the same thing. I mean, you're like, how did this car get down here? It is a steep embankment above it. Those text messages likely are giving us clues into what was going on in those moments. Is Matthew alone there or are there other people also there? How can you miss such a large piece of evidence 75 feet from where the car was found? Well, they've already made up their mind of what has happened. Yeah. So they're they're like, why why should we look? The last person he reached out to before yeah, he right. probably died. And you're just going to call him a whole ass body? Was it somebody else? Was he actually murdered at some other point and driven out there by somebody? I think there's much more to the story than meets the eye. Hey, what's up, everybody? And welcome back to Mile Heart Podcast, episode 288. I'm your host, Kendall. And I'm your host, Josh. And we are joined by our producer, Janelle. What's up, everyone? How is it going? Going pretty good. Well, today we are going to be talking about a case that is very frustrating. Um, there are a few different theories as to what possibly could have happened here. We are talking about the disappearance of Matthew Weaver Jr., which occurred in 2018. He was only 21 years old. Based on everything that happens, I think a lot of people, including investigators, kind of jump to what seems like the most obvious uh, conclusion to his, his disappearance, meaning that he may have taken his own life which is still a possibility but there is so many other just very honestly just bizarre things like the location of his vehicle where it ends up there's snapchat photos that are being sent there's this this woman that he was last with that has been less than cooperative with the family in helping them understand you know what they were talking about on on the night uh, prior to his disappearance. I mean, there's just so many different things. Very strange text messages that he sent to her as well. Yeah, there's quite a bit to go over. And I think what you meant is when you said the most obvious answer is like on a surface level right, that people right. would assume that without looking deeper or it's, you know, it's oftentimes what the police will jump to without digging deeper. And to us, that is not the most obvious answer. I mean, right. in my opinion. No, same here. And I mean, even to the police, it's kind of shocking because this area where he seemingly vanishes without a trace has all sorts of violence in its history. Yeah. And whether or not these different crimes are connected is one thing, but the sheer amount of people that disappear in this geographical region is honestly shocking. And... I don't know. It's led a lot of people to really become, including the family, become very frustrated with law enforcement that they're out there dealing with these crimes, with these homicides and disappearances all the time over the years since he's disappeared. And yet they are sticking to their guns that, you know, this was what happened and there's nothing further that we can do, despite additional evidence being found that the police initially missed. I mean, it just, the list goes on and on with this case. So, Ah, I just feel feel absolutely horrible for the family that this is the experience that they've had and they are still not closer to finding out what happened to their loved one. Yeah, they said it themselves in an interview that not knowing what happened to your loved one is just the worst thing ever. And I cannot I imagine what that, that would be like. It just terrible. Just terrible. So all we can do is you know, help share the story. They really need eyes on it at this point. They've really struggled to get any media attention and they're just looking for people to, you know, keep Matthew's memory alive, but to also be aware of his case and that maybe the right person knows something and that they're out there, which obviously we say that all the time, but it is so true. So let's go ahead and jump in by talking a little bit more about Matthew's background. So Matthew Weaver Jr. was born in Simi Valley, California on April 2nd, 1997, and was one of four children. Now, when Matthew was only four years old, his mom sadly abandoned him and his sister, Colleen, which is just 
terrible. And his father luckily stepped up to the plate, Matthew Weaver Sr., and he raised both of them as a single dad. And by the time that Matthew turned two and a half, his father had met and remarried a woman named Brooke Tipton. Now, Brooke treated Matthew and his sister as if they were, you know, her own children. And Brooke and Matthew Sr. ended up having two more children together as well, a boy and a girl. And Matthew absolutely adored his siblings, loved being a big brother. And, you know, their family was unique and felt very special to him, especially coming from such a rough start to life. And what's super, super impressive about Brooke is she joined their family when she was only 18 years old. And even though she was young, she stepped up and was an incredible mother to Matthew and his siblings. Brooke described him as being an extremely good kid who never threw fits, didn't really get into trouble and followed instructions and just truly didn't have, you know, a bad bone in his body. And as Matthew grew older, family continued to be something that was just really, really important to him. He was described as being that family member that was always making plans for the family get togethers and holiday celebrations, you know, sort of tying it all together. And according to his sister, Colleen, Matthew was very funny. He was loving and he was the kind of person that would give you the shirt off his back. He was always ready for an adventure and had a great sense of humor and a strong desire to travel the world. Matthew also had a huge passion for rescuing lost or injured animals. And at one point, he adopted a pit bull named Shadow, who was his absolute world. And this dog, he's so cute. Yeah, and I believe he just found this dog just out one day. He found this dog, brought it home. I believe that's the case, too. just fell in love with him. He's so cute. How could you not? If you're listening, you can't see him. I know. Looks like a best buddy. He's so cute. I love this picture of him and Matt. Matthew just looks so happy. Animals are truly... I know. Just the best. I mean, they are. You know, it's no wonder they say dogs are man's best friend. That's right. And woman's best friend. That's that's right. Thank you for yep. that. Anyway, around the time of his disappearance, he was reportedly kind of struggling to find himself after getting out of a long term relationship with his ex girlfriend Vanessa. But in April of 2018, things did begin to turn around. Matthew moved out of his grandmother's home where he had been staying and into his own apartment in Granada Hills. Now, Granada Hills is a neighborhood in the San Fernando Valley region of Los Angeles, about 20 miles, 20 minutes, sorry, west of Simi Valley. In the summer of 2018, Matthew began working with his dad, actually. Matthew Sr. worked in telephone construction and had recently taken Matthew Jr. under his wing and got him a position with the same company. Matthew did work on telephone poles and seemed to enjoy it. The only red flag noticed by Matthew's family was his recent association with a new group of friends who were heavily into drinking and drugs. And actually, in the weeks leading up to his disappearance, there were multiple times where he called in sick to work after a night of partying. And this was something that was you know, totally out of character for him. So they were starting to feel concerned that maybe he was kind of in with the wrong crowd and it was affecting him negatively in life. And then on the evening of August 9th, 2018, 21-year-old Matthew drove to visit his dad and pick up his paycheck, which was about $500. He then headed to his dad's house, and recently, Matthew Sr. bought a new handgun. That night, Matthew Jr. and his dad had a conversation about Matthew Jr.'s desire to buy his own gun. He also asked his dad if he could borrow his, and Matthew Sr. actually recalls, quote, I had my gun on the kitchen table. He asked to see it. I said, okay. I disarmed it, opened the chamber, and left it open. He wanted to take a pic of it in his hand, but I never asked him why. According to Matthew Sr., they talked a little bit longer before Matthew told him he had to go pick up a girl who he had shown his dad a picture of just a few days earlier. After this, he walked Matthew to his car, gave him a big hug, and told him he loved him. Before Matthew left, his dad remembers telling him to be safe and, quote, don't be driving fucked up. Matthew then left his father's house to go pick up his friend named Melissa in the San Fernando Valley area at 9.28 p.m. According to his family, she wasn't part of Matthew's usual circle of friends and was considered to be somewhat of a stranger. So it was obviously somebody that he had recently met. I don't know how far back it was, but I'm guessing the last couple of weeks they started getting to know each other. After Matthew picked up Melissa, they made a stop at Walmart and then the gas station After this, they then purchased some drugs, specifically marijuana and cocaine. According to Melissa, the two of them started the night by driving around, quote-unquote, partying. 
or aka taking drugs. Melissa later recalled that during the drive, Matthew became emotional and actually started crying, which made the situation awkward for her since she, quote, barely knew him. They eventually parked in front of her house where she said they had a long conversation throughout the night. For part of the night, they had a discussion about Matthew's biological mom abandoning him, which ultimately left him upset and in tears. Despite Melissa having to work the next morning, she felt compelled to stay awake and continue talking with Matthew until about 5 a.m. She claimed that Matthew dropped her off and told her he was heading home. However, instead of taking the direct route east to the Ronald Reagan freeway to his house, he drove south on Topanga Canyon Boulevard in the opposite direction. Matthew left his Snapchat open, which tracked his time and location down Topanga Canyon, down to the 101 freeway and eventually down Stunt Road, placing him in the Santa Monica Mountains around 5.35 a.m. His car stopped near the intersection of Stunt Road and Saddle Peak Road, which was a familiar spot where Matthew would often pull over to take in the view, and this is according to his ex-girlfriend, so I assume they went up there quite a bit. Between 5.45 and 6.24 a.m., Matthew's car maneuvered around Saddle Peak Road and Shuren Road near the parking lot close to the trailhead. There's actually an access road blocked by a supposedly locked metal gate. Matthew somehow managed to open the gate around 7 a.m. and a surveillance camera captures car going through, which would be the only vehicle to drive down the road that morning. Although the gate was said to be locked, it clearly wasn't at the time, and further investigation into this has shown that it is routinely left open, which raises question about security and public safety. The keys to the gate labeled do not duplicate are supposed to be restricted, but it's known that illegal copies of the key have been made in the past. And due to concerns about unauthorized access to this area, they've changed the lock several times, which obviously means they have to make new keys for it as well. However, despite the private property and no trespassing signs, based on you know the surveillance footage and his car, he proceeds down the road, seemingly ignoring all of the warnings, which is very odd. At 7.15 a.m., a security camera mounted on Topanga Microwave Tower captured a vehicle driving on the Topanga Tower motorway which is a one-way access road headed towards the Rosas Overlook. Matthew's cell phone GPS signal had also placed him at the Topanga Trail at 7.15 a.m. By 7.28 a.m., Matthew's car had reached the end of the Rosas Overlook Road. Continuing down a narrow asphalt road, Matthew eventually encountered a fork and opted for the route that eventually turned into a dirt hiking trail, which became an increasingly challenging journey for a car to make. And we're, he's driving a BMW sedan. So this is now entering like off-road territory. I mean, there's large rocks. It's very steep terrain. And the path is narrowing the further down he goes, which means that it's a one-way road. You're not going to be able to turn around because the path narrows so, so much to the point where you're stuck there, unless you're going to attempt to back your way completely out of it. But that's going to be difficult with all the rocks. And also it's like sheer drop-off. We also do know that Matthew's cell phone had tracked his location and last Snapchat post at 7.38 a.m., which was a scenic photo of the Rosas overlook he took. Around 8 a.m., he attempted to call his dad, but his dad was asleep still and did not answer the phone call. And as he continued to navigate down this winding and twisting path, he encountered rocks, boulders, and uneven terrain, even several sharp drop-offs scattered along the way. And eventually, the road led to a dead end, and this is when Matthew's car ended up getting stuck on a boulder. Now, we don't know if his car got stuck before or after calling his dad, but we do know that the last communication from Matthew was a text message sent to Melissa at 1150 a.m. This is the one we mentioned in the beginning. That's pretty strange. I'm going to read it exactly how it's written. It says, like some crazy going on shit going on. Then... At 11.53 a.m., he sends another text to her saying, I just, with two S's, to talk while I have the chance. After this, his phone either died or was turned off. So what do you make of that? I don't know what to make of that. I mean... Could be somebody in a hurry, yeah. you know, where you just accidentally type more characters than you're intending. I do that all the time. Yeah, I mean, even when you're not in a hurry, I just mess up on text messages constantly. Or if you're just like, like furiously dyslexic, trying but... to text a message real quick and send it off because yeah. yeah. something's going on truly, or obviously he's still feeling the effects of right. the substances he had taken. Yeah. I mean, there's so many possibilities. Um, it seems like most people lean towards the idea that he was under the influence and that's kind of what was causing the text to be strange. 
Or yeah, he was concerned or scared or in a hurry. Who really knows? So anyway, Melissa gets these text messages. She was at work and she responded to him at 12.54 p.m. saying, are you okay? After receiving no response, she texted him again at 4.25 p.m. asking, hey, are you okay? And once again, Matthew didn't respond. Then the following day at 1.11 a.m., just 24 hours after Matthew went missing, the Calabasas Police Department got a call from a group of hikers who reported hearing distress calls in the area. So yeah. we're going to actually play this 911 call. And we actually uh, got access to this thanks to the Immortal Investigations YouTube channel. Yeah, really uh, cool channel. Yeah, I don't Check think they're out. making videos anymore. Really? No, no. It looks like he hasn't been active for a few years. But um, he actually worked with a family on like a little docu series that he did. Really cool. It's like cool. four episodes. So he was actually able to get access to the 911 call. So. Uh, we'll obviously link his channel below if you want to check out his full docu series. But let's take a listen to the 911 call. 911, what is your emergency? Hey, I'm calling from Stunt Road, and we were hiking in Malibu, and we were hiking, and we saw a white horse that looked like it had maybe fallen off of the road. The doors were open. It was going far away from the road, and we could possibly get somebody screaming for help. How far off that road? Well, the hiking trails are probably about a mile. Okay, that's mile. good. That rail on that road, where did you guys start? At the overhead? I'm not from here. Okay, let me get on the line with the California Highway Patrol stand line. Okay. They said it was a white Porsche. It looked like a white Porsche. We could see the license plate reflecting, but it was just... Go ahead and the CHP now. Hello? Hello. Hi, this is the California Highway Patrol. Hey, so we're on the road, and we're take, we were taking a hiking trail, and uh, there was a white Porsche that looked like it had fallen off, possibly it had fallen off, of the road, the doors were open, and we think that we heard someone saying for help off into the distance. Okay, do you know where you are? I don't know exactly where we are. It's a little hiking trail now. Okay, well, do you know what hiking trail you're on? I think I'm going to go all I'm not sure what it's called on that from here. Are you there right now? Oh, um, we are. We're walking back to our car. It's near Stunt Road. I'm sorry, it's hard to understand. You're on what road? Stunt Road. Sorry, we're hiking back. What is... So obviously from that call, you know, they're, they're out there in the dead of night hiking and you come across a vehicle. And I can totally see when you look at the image of his vehicle in the daytime, I would probably think the same thing. I mean... They're like, how did this car get down here? It is a steep embankment above it. So obviously, in their minds, like this car slid off the road. They're hearing, you know, people crying out for help, and all the doors are open, and they're thinking, you know, obviously maybe there's been an accident here, or something like that. And it's just the lack of urgency from the dispatchers is like, okay, you know, obviously it seems like they can't really hear him all that well because she's not the best service out there. But right, but yeah, that's. That's what they had to go off of um, initially. And this is how they locate Matthew's vehicle. Yeah. And according to the report, someone heard a male and female calling for help and someone saying, quote, somebody has a gun. And when police investigated, that's, you know, they didn't find anyone, but that's when they found his silver BMW just abandoned. And since the car was registered to Matthew Sr., police reached out to him first. First responders arrived shortly after around 2 a.m., and at least two of them, a member of the California Highway Patrol and the Fire Department, also reported hearing screams or cries for help. The Lost Hills Sheriff's Department and Malibu Search and Rescue rushed to the scene with canine support as well. And Search and Rescue, including Air Rescue 5, conducted two searches of the Backbone Trail immediately upon learning of Matthew's disappearance. And at first, police canines picked up a scent, but they apparently lost it before actually reaching the road. Matthew's car was found at Topanga Lookout and Los Rosas Overlook, 
which is two miles from the intersection of Stunt Road and Shuren Road. And as you can see from the picture, this would be a very difficult drive and far drive to make for a BMW sedan. The rest of Matthew's family were notified about the situation at 5 a.m. And initially, they thought he was drunk, maybe accidentally got his car stuck, and then was just sleeping off the hangover at a friend's house. But by Sunday, August 11th, it became apparent to them that Matthew wasn't simply sleeping it off. Something bad must have happened. And now Matthew was nowhere to be found. Matthew's family was convinced that he got lost and was in need of help. And they were desperate to launch a search. And at first, the police assured the family that they would bring in helicopters and other resources to help look for Matthew. However, this didn't end up happening. Apparently, since there was no evidence of a crime being committed, the police didn't feel the need to initiate a search. Incredibly frustrating. And their decision raised some serious questions. Helicopters and advanced technologies are used in search and rescue operations for lost hikers every day. So why weren't they used in Matthew's case? Was it a conscious choice or was it a city policy? We're not quite sure. It doesn't really make any sense to me. The hike to Topanga Lookout past the locked white gate that Matthew's car had driven past is reportedly eerie, even in broad daylight. Apparently, it used to be a pretty peaceful trail that was frequented by hikers. However, more recently, it has become a sketchier area with more, I guess you could say, dicey individuals occupying it. Locals say that it has sort of evolved into a hike at your own risk type situation. And considering Matthew's last texts were like some crazy going on shit going on, and I just to talk while I have the chance, it's you know, pretty safe to assume that Matthew was probably in some sort of danger. Obviously, we've gone over the other options as well, and it's possible he wasn't in danger, but I think most people agree that those text messages likely are giving us clues into what was going on in those moments. Well, and let's not discount the fact that the hikers hear voices saying, help, help me. Yep. And then even the first responders that got there, two of them claim to have heard the same thing. Exactly. So that to me lends to there was something going on down there that night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially the first responders also noting that. Right. You know, I think that adds more credibility. And it makes sure. you wonder how many people are actually in this area. Is, yeah. is Matthew alone there or are there other people also there? Now that we have a child, it's more important to us to protect our home than ever before. I mean, when you love someone, you protect them in the best ways you can. And that's why we recommend Simply Safe's home security. We've been using Simply Safe's home security system for a couple years now. Like yeah, and we've four, tried five years. All the systems out there. Yeah, we have. Well, not all of them. Well, a lot of them. We've tried some of the largest, most well-known uh -huh. brands out there. And some of the ones you can probably think of off the top of your head. Not as great as you would think. No, I honestly can't stand them whatsoever. The contracts that those guys put you into yes. is absurd. It is. <laughs> like you have to fight tooth and nail to to ever leave them. And honestly, their equipment is severely outdated you have to pay somebody to come install it and overall my experience with them has been less than stellar versus simply safe is really on the cutting edge of technology and their customer service is top notch but best of all it is actually affordable for everybody i mean we're talking 24 7 professional monitoring for fast emergency response for less than a dollar a day i mean that is a really really good value simply safe is trusted by the experts which is why it was named best home security systems of 2024 by us news and world report and they have everything you need to protect your home top to bottom inside outside hd cameras for indoors outdoors i love their cameras i think their cameras are, are probably the best out there extremely clear you know they're not grainy and fuzzy like all these surveillance footage we often look at here on the podcast we're talking crystal clear video that you can identify vehicles people pets whatever it may be you can actually see what's going on through these cameras from anywhere they also have advanced motion sensors and entry sensors to protect doors windows and rooms they also have hazard sensors which are also important to have that detect fire flooding and so much more but what i really love about simply safe is how easy it is to set it up yourself i've done it before they give you a bunch of little like sticky pads for the sensors and you just literally go stick them up and then you're good to go in the windows doors cameras are easy to set up you don't need any special tools or hire anybody to do it you can do it yourself and what I also love is that their system is truly customizable for homes of all sizes, from an apartment to, I mean, you could protect your camper if you wanted to, all the way up to 
you know, a mansion, you could definitely cover it with Simply Safe. Plus, they give you a 60 day risk free trial, which is awesome. So, if you don't love your system, you can return it for a full refund. Plus, they even cover the return shipping. That's how confident they are that you're going to absolutely love Simply Safe. Order now to get 20% off your new Simply Safe system with Fast Protect monitoring. Don't wait. Visit simplysafe.com slash mile higher. That's simplysafe.com slash mile higher because there's no safe like Simply Safe. Oh, that was nice. Thank you. Thank you. However, by the second day of the search, investigators weren't concerned with foul play at this point, but instead started questioning the family about the possibility that Matthew Jr. had taken his own life. The sergeant on the case suggested that, and, and I think this is a fair suggestion, that people sometimes venture deep into the forest or wilderness in order to take their own life, making it a challenge for their families to find them. While the theory had some credibility given Matthew's familiarity with the area, it didn't make sense if his intention was to take his life in the middle of the woods. Why go through all the extra trouble of driving down a narrow dirt road? Like, why would he take his BMW down into this area? Because another thing to note is that Matthew was definitely like into cars as a lot of people, you know, young people who own BMWs. I know there's a whole community of people who own BMWs and, you know, they modify them and all that kind of stuff and, you know, like show them off. And, and Matthew very much, you know, took great pride in his, his BMW. So why risk damaging your BMW by taking it down this dirt road? It just doesn't really make sense. His family acknowledged that Matthew did have some struggles with his mental health in the past, including depression. However, they insisted he was not suicidal and did not think that this was a suicide attempt. And of course, we have to look at the most obvious question about this theory, right? Where is his body? You know, people who take their own life, you know, they their body is always left there. They don't just get up and walk away. So the remains are often found eventually. Understandably, his family has expressed extreme frustration with the police stating that 98% of the search effort was carried out by the family, which obviously is very frustrating. They've had to get volunteers, friends, and strangers to help. And it really seems like the police just kind of latched on to this suicide theory, seemed like most plausible to them despite everything, and just kind of discounted any other scenario. For starters, the Weavers initiated the first search party two days after Matthew went missing, and during one of their searches, the family heard faint whistling in the distance, which that, that's just crazy and honestly eerie. So imagine hearing faint whistling when you're out looking for your missing son. So they do the right thing. They call the police, and then they go wait in the parking lot for the police to come in and investigate the area. When police get there, they go down and start searching, but 30 minutes later, they come back and say, you know, not sure what you heard exactly, but Matthew is nowhere to be found. The family then asked if they could send someone to rappel down into the canyon because that's where they heard this whistling coming from. But the police said that they didn't need to send anyone down because it was just, quote, one of their guys they heard whistling earlier, which obviously this makes no sense whatsoever. It's like, okay, you know, now you're saying it's one of your guys down there. Uh, why wouldn't you let us know that you have a guy down there? It just seems like, honestly, a straight up lie to just not want to expend any more resources or send one of their guys down into the canyon. Uh, but yeah, this was a, a big point of contention for the family. And, you know, why would they even bother driving out there to investigate if they actually had their guys down there looking in the first place? After being told this, that it was just one of their own guys, Matthew's family had serious doubts about the truth behind his claim. So they actually contacted the department for answers, but they were unfortunately ignored. And when asked, the department refused to respond to requests for later comment. Several months passed without any leads as to what happened to Matthew, and Matthew's family, as you can imagine, was devastated and desperate for answers. Eventually, Matthew Sr. discovered that the last ping for Matthew's cell phone was near a large tree in the canyon. And this tree happened to be none other than in the same place they heard that faint whistling. Despite all of their efforts and countless searches of that area, there are still no signs of Matthew. In October of 2018, the family announced that there was a $50,000 reward for providing information leading to the whereabouts of Matthew. We actually have a small little clip uh, from the press conference around this reward fund, and uh, here's just a little snippet of Matthew Sr. speaking on this. We love and miss him so much. Um... So please help us uh, find out what happened to him. Stay strong. Matthew will find you. Imagine how frustrating 
it would be to find out that his cell phone pinged in an area where it's believed there was possibly whistling. Yeah, and then to be told by the police that they're not going to go investigate because they already had somebody down there yeah. who was making that whistling sound. I don't believe that. That is just... Yeah. I would go crazy. I'd be so angry. And you can tell from that clip, too, there's no law enforcement at this press conference. The family's having to do everything on their own, yeah, which just makes everything worse. No support. It's just, God, it's horrible. Matthew Sr. was understandably very frustrated with the lack of attention his son's case was getting, so he decided to get in contact with a woman named Cece Woods. Cece's an investigative reporter and editor-in-chief of the publication The Local Malibu. Cece was able to get the family in contact with a man named Jaden Brandt to assist in the search. Jaden is the founder of a private investigation and intelligence agency called Origin Investigations. And Jaden has a ton of experience. He's a former law enforcement officer. He has extensive knowledge and training in criminal investigation, interrogation, undercover surveillance, case management, evidence handling, as well as California and federal law. So a great asset to their search. I'm not exactly sure on this, but the family either hired a land survey company or the company just pro bono flew a drone over this area where Matthew's vehicle was and where he was last seen and took 797 high def photos that were released online to the public, which are still out there today. We'll, we'll put the link there so you can go take a look because obviously they're like, police aren't yeah. helping us. We, we have these photos. Let's see if anybody out there in the public can help us find something. And someone did. This is honestly incredible. And it really just goes to show you how helpful it is as an average person to take that extra step and take a look at something like these types of photos because one viewer happened to notice that there was something resembling a red hat in one of the photos. And then their family searched that area because of it. And that's where they found a huge piece of evidence matthew's red los angeles angels baseball hat and it's actually you know obviously when you would find a red hat you could think oh it's maybe anyone's hat right how do you know it's his it was 100 percent his because it was a rare limited edition la angels hat that was custom fitted for matthew and luckily his ex-girlfriend vanessa had the receipt for it still which is just so lucky that she happened to have that and it had the unique size and model number on the receipt, and it ended up being a match. So they are absolutely sure that it was his, which, as you can imagine, is a just huge. And in addition to the hat, his stepmom, Brooke, discovered torn pieces of white uh, plain T-shirt with some dried blood on it, which she believed to be Matthew's and Unfortunately, they turned the shirt over to LAPD for DNA testing, and they were hopeful that they would assist in the search because bloody clothing, you know, would indicate a crime or some type of medical emergency, and they did nothing with it. In fact, it took several months for the family to hear from them regarding the shirt, and several months passed before they finally received word from LAPD about the DNA testing of the white t-shirt, and unfortunately, the police just claimed that the testing was inconclusive so more time passed and there was still no sign of matthew no more leads or anything like that and then in january of 2019 a hiker actually discovered matthew's car key and get this it was just 75 feet from where his car had been found which oh my god would make me so infuriated if i were in this family how can you miss such a large piece of evidence 75 feet from where the car was found and a and red hat. A huge fuck up. Seriously. In this like kind of deserty landscape, mm -hmm. a red hat sticks, sticks out. out. I mean, someone was able to see it from like drone photos. Yeah. So I get, you know, it's brush and stuff, but it just shows the police really didn't do much of a search at all. I mean, not to mention, shouldn't the police be the ones looking through those drone photos that the family is organizing to, to get these? Well, they've already made up their mind of what has happened. Yeah. So they're they're like, why why should we look? Oh, God, it's so maddening. Well, even though this was frustrating to feel like this was just completely missed in a botched initial search, it was, you know, it gave the family some hope, feeling like they found something. Um, here's a clip of Matthew's father talking about this after finding his keys. We will accept anybody that will help us. 
Matthew Weaver Sr. says he has renewed hope in the search for his son, Matthew Weaver Jr., who's been missing since August 10th. Last month, a pair of hikers found the key to his car on a trail in Malibu. It was about 25 feet from where his BMW was located last fall. We know he's out here and we want to find him. And that was only from the help of of others. He's talking about a volunteer who took drone pictures of the canyon area near Stunt and Saddle Peak Road, where Weaver Jr. was last seen. A few weeks ago, his father found pieces of a torn white T-shirt, which he believes is the same one his 21-year-old son was last seen wearing. But the family says their biggest break came when someone spotted his red throwback angels hat seen in this picture. His ex-girlfriend says the cap found matches Weaver's hat size. Uh, I actually bought him that hat. Weaver's family has set up a website with more than 700 pictures, hoping to keep interest in his case alive. They say they can't name everyone who's helped, but they say they couldn't have gotten this far without the community. It's just been incredible for just all the help. And it's just normal people helping, and it's been great. For complete strangers uh, nowadays to, to to go ahead and do things like that, just it, it means the world that they're helping me look for my son. Also, his family realized that his car and his car key were on the opposite side of the Rosas overlook from where his last cell phone ping and clothing were found. At some point, investigators discovered that the trunk lock on Matthew's car had been recently damaged from the inside, suggesting that maybe he could have been held against his will. Some have speculated that the surveillance camera only showed Matthew's car being driven by someone, but have pointed out that that someone may not necessarily have been Matthew himself. Investigator Jaden Brandt confirmed with his friends that Matthew had been drinking and using drugs on the night of August 9th, which raised the possibility of a drug deal gone wrong. Although driving down a road where he couldn't turn around would, you know, seem pretty unusual in that scenario as well, but it is a possibility. It's also possible he might have been forced down Stunt Road or, as mentioned earlier, lured there in some way. CeCe Woods, the lead journalist on Matthew's case, mentioned that luring someone to a secluded area is a common tactic used by drug gangs like MS-13. They isolate individuals to recruit them, and if they refuse, they're killed. However, both the Weavers and CC believed he was already dead before the car was recorded passing the microwave tower on Stunt Road. They argued that Matthew wouldn't have taken his car down that dirt road unless he was forced or being chased. There was actually a similar incident in 2023 where five young men were lured by a Mexican drug cartel with a fake job offer and were brutally murdered and beheaded when they refused to join. And sadly, this unfortunate event was caught on tape and the graphic video made the rounds online. As the private investigation progressed, investigator Brant, Cece, and Matthew's family learned that Matthew had recently been involved with drugs as well as gangs. They I, ble- remember, I remember when that happened. I'm so glad I never saw that video, but I've heard people talk about it. It's absolutely terrifying. Just uh, the ruthlessness of these, these gangs are unbelievable. So the theory is that they think Matthew posted the photo with his dad's gun on Snapchat in order to deter potential threats or to signal to others he was ready for a violent encounter of some kind. And again, that Snapchat photo, we'll put it up if you're watching, says game over on it, which could mean a lot of different things. One of Matthew Jr.'s friends would later tell his father that he had also asked him to borrow a gun that night. Either way, his actions indicated that he was anticipating being in some kind of danger or being put into a dangerous situation where he might need a firearm. After years of searching for answers about what happened to Matthew Weaver Jr., a body has never been found, and his family is no closer to finding answers about what happened to their beloved son and brother. Search and Rescue conducted at least five or more searches to date, and the Weaver family themselves have conducted at least 15 or more searches with their family and friends and volunteers. Matthew's cell phone and wallet have also never been found. So you've got cell phone pings happening in this area, yet no cell phone has been found. That's very, very odd. A candlelight vigil hike was held for Matthew on August 10, 2019, exactly one year after he disappeared. And I think this is an annual occurrence that they do. Family, friends, and supporters gathered at Stunt Road and Saddle Peak Road and hiked to Matthew's last known location. Here's a little uh, of the local news coverage on 
this event. Well, Chris, Matthew Weaver's loved ones made a slow and quiet hike tonight to his last known location, a spot 20 minutes up this remote Malibu hiking trail. They hiked tonight to keep attention on their continuing search for answers. Matthew Weaver's family says retracing his path tonight on the one-year anniversary of his disappearance was agonizing but necessary. This beautiful spot marred now by a heartbreaking mystery. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I hate this place. <laughs> um, yeah, it's hard. It's hard every time and every time I get out here to search I get very overwhelmed. Through social media, investigators can tell the 21-year-old Simi Valley man was here at the Rosa Overlook on the morning of August 10th, 2018. Later that night, a witness called 911 after hearing someone in the area yelling for help. First responders didn't find any victim, but did find Weaver's gray BMW. His family has never stopped looking for him. I've been crying this every single day, I cry. There's nothing else to do. You just, whether it be looking at the drone photos, coming out here, searching, looking, hosting searching groups, something. It's just always trying to bring awareness. In January, his family set up a website with more than 700 pictures and drone video of the rugged terrain, asking the public for help looking for signs of him. It led them to finding his baseball cap. Hikers found his car keys earlier this year, and his dad found a torn white T-shirt here that he thinks belonged to his son. Clues, but not a complete answer. As his friends and family carried signs with his picture tonight, they said they're also holding on to hope, though the reality is what they're hoping for has changed. We know that he's probably never coming home, you know, but at this point, it's like our, our family needs closure. His family needs him. We want to know what happened to him. Just please bring him home. As you heard in that clip, the family obviously is you know, started dealing with the reality of the situation that Matthew is, you know, likely not alive anymore, but obviously they want to bring him home, give him a memorial service, and hopefully get more answers as to what happened to him. Or possibly hold whoever. Yeah, or whoever did this to him responsible. So as we've talked about many times, we have three cats and we love them so much. They We've had them all now since we got our first cat in 2012. So yeah, we've had them all over 10 years now. Anyway, people love our cats and coming over to see our cats, but there was one time, well, several times back when we lived in our last house, remember how bad the litter boxes started to smell and we just got used to it because we, we were in the house all the time. But then I remember there was one time we came home from vacation and we walked in and we're like, oh my God, like, is this how it is you could almost all the time? See, Do people smell this? You could really almost see the stench coming up from downstairs. And we were using clay litter at the time and clay litter just does a horrible job at trapping odors, it seems like. And what a mess. You know, I've been, you know, king of the scooping for a long time and clay litter just, I felt like I had to take a shower after scooping dust gets all up in your face it just stinks it gets everywhere too absolutely everywhere that we're like we need something there's got to be something better out there on the market and you know we've been working with pretty litter for a long time actually uh several years at least now and we will never use another cat litter because pretty litter instantly traps those nasty odors and it's super ultra absorbent which means that you use way less litter yeah. than you would with clay litter clay litter you're constantly changing it out and it's heavy it's bulky i remember we go to the store and have to buy the big oh with three God. cats you got to yep. buy a lot of litter so you get these big boxes they're super Lugging heavy inside. yeah they look ugly mm -hmm. pretty litter is great because it's super light it comes in six pound bags and they show up right at your door on time on schedule when you need it and it is actually nice to look at it's this nice white crystally it's beautiful sparkles we put it on display yeah we do <laughs> yeah now no. our litter boxes are just out in the middle of the living room no just kidding but, but for real the best part of it for me is that it gives us peace of mind especially now that all our cats are over the age of 10 because pretty litters crystals change color to indicate early signs of potential illnesses in our cats like urinary tract infections kidney issues and more so we count on pretty litter to keep our house smelling fresh and clean and you can too Go to prettylitter.com slash milehar to save 20% on your first order. That's prettylitter.com slash milehar to save 20% 
on your first order. Check it out today at prettylitter.com slash mile higher. Terms and conditions apply. See site for details. The Weavers believe that if Matthew really did take his own life, they would have found his body by now. Especially if you consider the train where his car was found, someone wouldn't be able to travel very far on foot. And if not his body, then at least a cell phone or a wallet. Especially after five years of searching in this area where his car was discovered. That being said, there are several plausible theories circulating about what could have occurred on that fateful morning in August 2018. So many people online do believe that he took his own life. After all, Matthew was distraught and he had recently ended a long-term relationship and to add to the turmoil, he had been drinking and possibly using drugs. This combination could have put him in a state of mind that led to suicidal thoughts. The speculation was, did he intend to drive off a cliff? He was familiar with this location. It was somewhere they loved to go. He posted pictures of it. And so when he drove down that road that was not meant for cars, you know, did he kind of anticipate that this would be kind of like his last drive? He's not going to get his car out of there. So, you know, he knew he wasn't going to leave that location possibly. Or did he walk off into the wilderness to find another way to end his life? But if that's the case, how did he do it? We do know he didn't have his dad's gun, but it's possible he could have purchased one from somebody or somewhere or gotten one from a friend, but as far as we know, there's no record of that ever happening. There's also the lingering question about the last text that he sent to Melissa. What did it mean? Some people think that it just indicated he was troubled, maybe he needed help like mentally, maybe he was like struggling with suicidal thoughts and wanted to talk to somebody before he went through with it. I can see that. I feel like that's less likely. Who really knows? In my opinion, I interpret them as he's talking about something that's currently going on. Right. That's that's kind of the way I lean, especially considering all the other evidence. And or again, he's intoxicated at this point, and that's why the texts look the way that they do. Although if he was really intoxicated, I don't even know if you'd be able to text at all. Right. You know, or he was just on, incredibly fearful right. in those moments. I think the biggest thing for me is where is he? If he did take his own life, there wouldn't be any reason for anybody to like go and hide his body, right? Or get rid of it or whatever. He would have been found in this location near where his belongings were found. Yeah. There would be other traces of his Why remains. would he want to put his loved ones through that, through not knowing where he is, you know, to if he were to, because some people do commit suicide and, and, do it somewhere where no one's going to find them. I don't think, I just, I don't know. I obviously, you never know what's going on in someone's life. His family has said they don't think he would have committed suicide. Even the happiest people do, of course. I know we're going to get those comments, but it, se it really seems like the least likely scenario to me. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility, though. We're talking about a large, large area of land. It's rural. Obviously, there's hikers that go through there, but there is heavy brush, lots of places that a body could, you know, land under. And I guess, I and, guess but how awful the searching has been. You know, it's exposed to the elements, so therefore it could decompose fairly quickly. There's wild animals out there that could get a hold of the remains that would make it faster. But even then, I think there would be more traces, right? Because there's more belongings that wouldn't decompose, right? The wallet, the cell phone his other clothing, I feel like his shoes, whatever he would like, there would be other things found that would lead to that conclusion. And the fact that it seems like to me that these things were just thrown out there randomly, like somebody just took all of his things and just threw them off the side, like trying to hide it that way versus, you know, him dropping his hat here, dropping his keys here and then continuing on his way. Is it possible? Sure. He could have walked for as long as, as he possibly could before he decided to do it. And he's just, his remains are out there somewhere undiscovered still. But I do think it is unlikely at this point yeah, based on I, the I just, searching. The text messages are what really get me. Him saying basically something crazy is going on. Yeah. I don't think that adds up with taking his own life. That'd be very confusing. He left like, no form of note or said anything to anyone at any point that would indicate that that's where he was yeah. headed mentally. I don't know. I just, to me, that's... The way like that said, those the messages look is there's something else going on, not necessarily something going on with me. You know what I mean? He's observing something is right. kind of the way that you take those messages. That's what I think.
Um, of course, there is the possibility that if he wasn't in his right frame of mind, maybe he got into some, he had some sort of accident, right? Could he have had drug-induced hallucinations? I mean, we can't be 100% sure about Matthew's actions that night because we only have Melissa's account. And if he accidentally crashed his car there, maybe he wandered off from that area, especially when he you know, couldn't reach his dad. It's also believed that maybe his car got stuck around the time that he called his dad. Then there was a three-hour gap before he messaged Melissa those messages about something crazy going on. Perhaps the drugs were playing tricks on his mind. That's always a possibility. And if he did wander off, is it possible he just kind of succumbed to the elements? Again, it would seem like even in that case, likely he would have been found by now. But the Santa Monica Mountains are vast, and it's an area that has been searched many times. So, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's unlikely. Yeah, I do too. Of course, we do want to bring up the fact that if he did die in some type of accident, it's possible wild animals could have dragged him off or, you know, in some way made this search even more challenging. August 10th was a very hot day. It was 98 degrees. And if Matthew didn't have water with him, he could have easily suffered from dehydration or heat stroke, something like that. And during the investigation, friends revealed that Matthew had a head injury a few days before. They believe that he may have been acting erratically because of it, which is a very real possibility. Now, his family had been unaware of this, so we have no idea how he sustained this injury or if it's even true. But if it is true, it could certainly have affected his thinking in that time. If this was truly an accident, though, could it explain the text messages to Melissa? Did he find himself in some sort of random danger that he just came across and he reached out for help? Or maybe it's odd that he would reach out for her to help him because, you know, he wasn't close with her. It didn't sound like. Well, and if he, if he, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, even if he was, you know, found himself in random danger, why wouldn't you call emergency services or your dad? Yeah. Like, why text Melissa? That's what I'm saying. I mean, I know he called his dad, but why not call the emergency services if you crash your car or... Yeah. Yeah, good point. Like, it seems like someone else was involved to not allow him to do that. Because if it was just an accident, something weird happened and he's by himself and he's in danger, you'd call the police. Yeah. I mean, Melissa's making it sound like she barely knew him. Yeah. I mean, who knows the extent of their relationship truly? But, I'm yeah, very it's, it's suspicious. Odd. I know. I'm very suspicious of her. And on that. I don't know. So let's talk about the seemingly most plausible theory here being that foul play was involved in Matthew's disappearance. Again, just to go over it, you know, his family has really insisted that he was not suicidal. They say that he had just picked up his last paycheck. He secured his own apartment. He had recently started working with his dad. Um, even if he had started drinking and dabbling in drugs, those close to him don't believe that he would have taken his own life. And like I said, obviously no one wants to believe that about their family member, but I do think they have some valid points that we we have to consider. Doesn't mean it's not a possibility, but anyway, let's talk about Melissa a little bit more. Melissa had posted an odd Snapchat only eight days after he disappeared. And this Snapchat raised questions among you know people on the internet looking into the case, making them wonder if there wasn't something more going on that could have involved Melissa herself. In the video, Melissa talked about how stupid everyone was for thinking she knew anything. People noted her lack of emotion and little regard for Matthew during the video. And at the end, she casually said, bitch, I ain't capable of all that. That's a whole ass body. That is a weird sus thing to say like just referring to matthew as a body whether or not she involved. had any involvement yeah. like that's just rude yeah horrible yeah, like offensive. who fucking talks like that a body this was someone you were just spending time with. the last person we believe she was with or he was with the last person he reached out to yeah, before he right. probably died and you're just gonna call him a whole ass body it's Something, pretty shocking. Something's very it's, weird. It's very weird. I mean, it could just be she's lack just of like, empathy. She's just like just, this. Yeah, yeah. but it, it is. I understand why people think it's weird. And then later on, she made a post on Instagram 
which really portrays a whole different picture of their relationship than what she had originally stated to the police. I mean, initially she was claiming she barely knew him, but then she went on later on Instagram and wrote this. Prayers going out to my boy. The last conversation we had was deep. This was our go-to spot. I don't want to believe that I won't ever be there with you again. Wherever you are, come home. If anyone has any info, don't hesitate to call, text, DM me, hashtag pray for Matthew. Yeah, it doesn't sound like someone you uh, barely knew. Or is this all an act? Well, yeah, that's, I mean, you can look at this two different ways, right? Yeah. Maybe she told the police she barely knew him for certain reasons, and then this is the truth, or she really did barely know him, or they didn't have a super close relationship, and she's, you know, some people, when people pass, a lot of the time, people come kind of out of the woodwork to kind of, to get attention, you know? Possibly. I I tend to think. And I don't mean it in a way that she's like not entitled to to say these things, but like sometimes people I have seen, I think everyone out there has when seen the case starts where people getting will exaggerate coverage and attention and yeah, and not just in true crime cases, but just like when when people pass, yeah, there will be people who claim to have been super close with them when, like, would you say all these things about them if they were still alive to their face? You know what I mean? I don't know. Maybe I'm just reading too much into it, but. Well, it probably has something to do with the fact that Matthew's family and sister have been very active on social media in this, you know, the campaign to find him. And yeah. so there's there's a lot of social media chatter going on. And, you know, it could be a defense mechanism for her because she could be getting attacked because people think she's involved. Yeah. Yes. And so That's she's tra- this too. is like how she's trying to clear her name. Yeah. But I, I have a different theory to all this, which I'll. I'll share at the end because I don't know, for some reason, a theory in my brain is clicking together. And I don't mean to, I don't mean to be harsh. No, I think it's a fair, fair I'm really, really put off by her saying, calling him a whole ass body. That just hit me. I mean, what the fuck is that? Well, how do you think his father and his sister feel about that comment? I would be livid. Right? If someone said that about my missing loved one. days later. Eight days later, you were the last person he reached out to. I don't know. I think the whole thing is incredibly strange. And the eerie text messages that he sent to her, you know, indicated that something crazy was going on. Could Melissa and someone else have driven Matthew down Stunt Road with his phone before sending herself a text message from his phone to make herself look innocent? Is that a possibility? Absolutely a possibility, if you ask me absolutely a possibility here i think there's much more to the story than meets the eye and again let's remember that that microwave tower has that surveillance footage of the car going down the road and you know one possibility is that was matthew driving and he got down there and there was something nefarious going on down there that he witnessed and therefore because he was a witness to what was going on they subsequently murdered him and then hit his body Perhaps it was a group of people. There's also a possibility of a serial killer operating in this area, uh, which given Malibu Canyon's violent history and actually a serial shooter that was out there and just the sheer amount of violent crime, I'm, I would not be surprised. I actually, you know, I, I know the news clips sometimes get a little much, but this one I think is very important because it really opens your eyes to all of the crazy violent crime that is happening in the Malibu Canyon area. Let's take a look at this. Multiple searches both in the air and on the ground have come up empty, and Weaver's family is growing increasingly frustrated, especially since the area has been recently plagued by unexplained violence. In June, a 35-year-old man was shot in the head at Malibu Creek State Park while his daughter slept in a tent they were sharing. Two other bodies were also recently dumped along roadsides, and other people have disappeared in the same vicinity. Weaver's loved ones can't help but wonder if there's a connection. At this point, we we know something happened to him, or he'd be around. As you just saw, obviously a lot of very violent crime happening in this area, and it's important to note that some of these cases were solved and deemed unrelated, but speculation does still continue to this day. Law enforcement still doesn't believe that the cases are related Yet there's a lot of people online that have made some valid connections between them. Matrice Lavon Richardson 
was a 24-year-old woman who went missing on September 17, 2009 and was found dead on August 9, 2010, almost exactly eight years before Matthew. She had been missing for 11 months before park rangers discovered her body. The case itself is filled with strange elements that strongly suggest foul play was involved. However, law enforcement officially ruled it as an accidental death. They were fucking awful in that case. Yeah, you've covered this one on your I channel, have, haven't yeah. you? Yeah. yeah, maybe we can link it below or you can just type in Kendall Ray Matrice Richardson, but yeah, it's, it's a... So much a so the one. family has sued mm -hmm. the city and the county yep. numerous times. And of course, there's a notorious case of Elaine Park, who still remains missing since January 28, 2017, after leaving her boyfriend's house in Calabasas. Her vehicle was found deserted along the Pacific Coast Highway in Malibu. The route she took between the two locations led her through the scenic Malibu canyons. If you look into any of these missing persons cases, the other three are likely to pop up because they all happen in the same geographical region under mysterious circumstances. That said, there are many more that have gone missing or were murdered in the Malibu Canyon area, and these cases can be easily be found online. In fact, many of these other cases have fueled a current conspiracy theory that something unknown and sinister is actually going on out there. Due to the rural and rugged area, it could potentially attract criminal activity or be susceptible to disappearances thanks to the challenging terrain of the mountains and canyons, as well as the presence of local wildlife such as mountain lions. But does this alone explain all of the violent and bizarre situations that routinely occur there? I don't think so. And then also, in the summer of 2018, just prior to Matthew going missing, there was a continuous threat of gunfire in the canyon following the tragic murder of Tristan Baudet, which happened at Malibu Creek State Park on June 22, 2018. And after that, the entire community was on edge. In the prior months, the local Malibu earned recognition for its role in uncovering a law enforcement cover-up regarding shooting incidents at the Malibu Creek State Park, stretching back to 2016. And despite the escalating tension fueled by a recent murder and the persistent reports of shots being fired, authorities failed to issue warnings to the public about the dangerous situation leading up to Tristan's fatal encounter. His life was cut short after being shot in the head inside of his tent at 4.44 a.m. as he was lying beside his two daughters. Horrifying. Horrifying. Now, given this history of violence, it's frustrating and puzzling that when Matthew went missing, local news stations kind of chose to turn a blind eye to his family's pleas for coverage. And the family's frustration escalated when authorities initially dismissed Matthew's disappearance as a potential suicide despite heightened danger in the canyon and the looming threat of a sniper. As we mentioned, due to lack of coverage on the case, Matthew Sr. turned to the local Malibu, hoping that would allow for more exposure in the case and assistance locating his son. And their knowledge of the area allowed them to draw connections between Matthew's disappearance, the ongoing shootings, and the other two mysterious disappearance within the canyon over the past decade. And going back to Matrice Richardson for a second, her disappearance happened back in 2009, and it is super sketch. She was actually, I mean, there's a lot to the story, but she was released from the Lost Hills Sheriff Department, and it was around midnight when they let her go, um, which is a whole discussion to be had on its own. But it took a whole 11 months before they found her body, and guess where they found her? Yep, in the same canyon where Matthew vanished from. Elaine Park, who disappeared in 2017, was last seen in the same canyon where Matthew and Matrice had vanished, and she actually still remains missing. To date, over 2,000 tips have been submitted for Matthew's case, and ongoing efforts are being made to sift through the information. The bloodstained t-shirt, the Angels baseball cap, and his car key are still awaiting further DNA testing. And despite, I think, pretty strong indications of possible foul play in this case, we can clearly see that the LAPD's cooperation in this case has been severely limited, to say the least. And as time has passed, new theories have emerged. According to the Weavers, John Jennings, the man who owns the Topanga Microwave Tower and surrounding property, has been incredibly uncooperative regarding Matthew's disappearance and has even threatened to shoot or mace them during their searches, which is just absolutely absurd. The LAPD was notified, but they turned a blind eye and did nothing. It's extremely odd that not only was John so cold towards a family whose son and brother went missing, but also for threatening them with violence for simply searching for them. 
His sister Colleen made a TikTok post in 2021 about John Jennings and his gr- aggressive behavior towards her and the rest of her family. Let's take a look at that. Oh, yes, very happy to answer this question. So this is a uh, Topanga microwave tower. It was an old AT&T radio, but now some man named John Jennings owns it. And apparently there's a little bunker thing back there in the microwave tower. It's closed now. You used to be able to hike up there from all the tagging. All you can see here. And then you can see up right there, the tower in the background. This would have been the road that Matthew would have driven down. So from this tower, you can see everything. Uh, but pretty much we've had problems with them from the start. Their property line is about, you can't see in the video, but it's a little bit up there. Pretty much they've threatened us with guns, knives. They said they're going to shoot us. They said, we don't know what the fuck happened to your brother. We don't know what the fuck happened to Matthew Weaver. And pretty much have lied and threatened to mace us, shoot us. Please do nothing. On November 14, 2019, the family posted a video on the Help Find Matthew Weaver Jr. Facebook page of their interview with Access Daily. This would be one of the first and only news outlets to interview the Weavers about Matthew's case. Um, And of course, we'll link that for you if you want to check it out. A little less than a year later, Matthew's story was fortunately featured on Investigation Discovery in September of 2020. We'll put the link for that out there as well. It's on YouTube. And as this case began to pick up steam, so did the interviews. The television show Never Seen Again, which is on Paramount Plus, does an in-depth episode about the life and disappearance of Matthew uh, which includes interviews with his family, which we watched, uh, I think is definitely worthwhile checking out. And as of now, the main people still working on Matthew's case include Cece Woods from the local Malibu family, friends, local strangers, and everybody online. Uh, and we're not really sure whether or not Jaden Brandt from Origin Investigations is still involved. He was involved uh, as of 2022 because he's a part of that uh, Paramount Plus episode on Matthew's case, but uh, we haven't seen anything about him still being involved since. His sister is still very active on social media where she makes posts about her brother's disappearance and routinely responds to the public's questions regarding the case to help find answers and raise awareness. We'll link her TikTok for you as well. Things took a turn for the worse, though, when Matthew Weaver Sr. was actually arrested on September 7, 2020 after engaging in a shootout with the California Highway Patrol just one month following the two-year anniversary of his son's disappearance. The incident occurred after they responded to a report of a stolen car at Matthew Sr.'s property in Silmar around 8.30 p.m. According to his daughter Colleen, her father's mental health has been rapidly declining ever since his son went missing. He is still extremely upset over the lack of response and initiative that local law enforcement has shown towards him and his family who are still being stonewalled regarding any request for information on the night Matthew vanished. An initial incident report has still not been given to the Weavers, with the Sheriff's Department claiming it can't find the report despite it happening in their jurisdiction. They claim all they have on record regarding Matthew's case is that 911 call you heard a, a clip of from earlier. Several family members arrived on the scene following a shootout uh, with Matthew Sr. to try to reason with him and get him to calm down. He was clearly intoxicated and suffering from a mental breakdown. Dr. Rhonda Hampton, a mental health expert with a decade of experience in missing persons cases, shared insights on the events leading up to Matthew Sr.'s breakdown. She says, quote, as a psychologist who has dealt with years of unanswered questions, law enforcement misconduct, and a lack of concern for the missing, I can attest to the toll on mental health. The trauma of searching for a loved one causes immense pain and stress that is only exacerbated when law enforcement is uncooperative. I mean, just think about how angry you would be if you were in that position where you your loved one is missing, you need help and you're just not getting it. They're not even listening to you, not taking the necessary steps. And you're seeing in other, you know, other jurisdictions that possibly they are taking the actions that you would have liked to have. Um, well, I think they're upset because there's been a lot of back and forth between whose case is it? Because I believe the sheriff's department then handed over to LAPD and, you know, things have gotten lost in translation. Yeah, and all the time. You know, the missing report and everything is just a just a tragedy. But Matthew Sr. is actually serving a 15-year sentence uh, for the incidents uh, that happened that night. And what's crazy is that he doesn't even remember what he did. That just breaks my heart. And in no way am I, like, making excuses for, for what he did. I mean, it's, it's what he did was very serious, very scary. Um, but 
I think everyone probably agrees. You just got to feel really bad for him that he he was experiencing a mental breakdown. He couldn't. He has no recollection of this happening, and he's serving 15 years for it, and and can't continue to search for his son because he's locked up. And yeah, I'm not trying to make excuses. I think you know you can have empathy for him and um, understand how serious that was at the same time. Yeah. But in the end, all we're left with is questions in Matthew's case. I mean, did he commit suicide? Was it a case of getting involved with the wrong crowd? Or is there something more significant at play that involves the LAPD or possibly other people in his life? I mean, are there people that haven't been held accountable for what could have happened to him? I mean, there's so many different possibilities. We've really gone through them all. Um, Obviously, we're curious to hear your thoughts on this case, but Despite lack of help from authorities and media, Matthew's family and friends and just concerned citizens um, who have really stepped up and and helped this family, as you heard them saying in some of those clips, um, continue to search for answers to this day. Matthew Weaver Jr.'s disappearance is still unsolved. However, it is certainly not forgotten about. And this tragic incident has shed light on possibly corrupt police department while shining the spotlight on other missing persons cases as well. And hopefully sooner than later, the Malibu Police Department will have a change in heart and maybe be more forthcoming and helpful regarding Matthew's case and other reported crimes in the area. But until that day comes, his family continues to grieve and ask these questions and just try to keep, you know, his name and his face and story out there as best as they can. Yeah, I think going back to just want to share my theory real quick because and I think this is probably shared by a lot of other people, including Cece uh, from the Malibu publication. Her her investigation into the gang activity to me really sticks out. If he was, you know, he was. We know he was involved with drugs, involved with gangs potentially. Melissa potentially could be involved with this gang as well. I wonder. I do wonder about her involvement in all of this. And you know, in my opinion, I think it's very suspicious. Uh, the way that she acted and things that she said, the fact that she was with him all night. And, you know, we don't even know what transpired all night. You know, to be in a car talking all night long, that's a long period of time. So it makes me wonder what what really happened. How did Matthew's car actually get there? Was he the one driving or was he was it somebody else? Was he actually murdered at some other point and driven out there by somebody? That's a possibility as well. Yeah. Or he went out there to meet somebody as a part of this, your lord out there by somebody involved with this gang or, you know, somebody he had connections with in the drug world. That to me seems like the most likely activity. I, I really believe that he was lured out to this location for for some reason. Mm-hmm. And or he was already deceased by the time he got out there and his car was dit- just ditched there. And staged. It looked like kind of a stage scene. I will say, though, that I know we had brought up the idea of his text messages possibly being sent by someone else to look like he sent them. But I don't know. They seem to me like he wrote them. Obviously, that's a possibility. But I think if you were to stage something like that, they would be different. I don't know. They just don't strike me as staged text messages. But and maybe they're not, I'm not an staged expert. text messages. Maybe he was actually out there and he was out there to, to meet somebody. And then, yeah, I think that's the most guys important. get out with guns and he realizes like, yeah, things are, yeah. things are going south and he quickly firing off messages. But why would he send them to Melissa? That, that is very weird that yeah. those are, that's who he's sending them to. Well, yeah, there's a lot there's of mystery some, to this yeah. case for sure. Yeah, I don't want to speculate too much, but anyway, how can you help? Let's go over. The details about Matthew one more time. He disappeared in 2018 at the age of 21. He stood five foot nine inches tall and weighed 160 pounds. His last known attire consisted of a plain white t shirt, black dicky pants, red shoes, and a Los Angeles Angels baseball cap. Notably, Matthew had a tattoo with the name Jeremiah in script lettering surrounded by swirls on the left side of his chest. And to help look for clues, you can check out those over 700 photos that were taken via drone. Um, They have been shared by the family and they're available to view at matthewweaver.tips. And don't forget to lend your support on the Facebook page or their Instagram. Um, It's 
we will have it all linked below. The Facebook page goes under Help Find Matthew Weaver Jr., um, where they're offering a $50,000 reward for anyone with information leading to Matthew. And, you know, if you are, you know, you never know. Someone out there might have even the slightest little bit of information that could crack a case wide open. So even if you are unsure, maybe you live in the area and you think maybe I could have, I have something that could help them, um, please get in touch with the family on their website or the Los Angeles Police Department at their missing persons unit. But I would definitely get that information to the family. Um, I mean, both would be good, but. Yeah, well, if the private investigator is still involved, they can also follow up on it yeah. as well. Yeah, and uh, you can contact the missing persons unit at 213-996-1800. Definitely let us know your thoughts on this case, you guys. We always like to hear from you on, you know, all the different possibilities and some of the theories we threw out there and information. Um, yeah, really, really frustrating one. I feel just so badly for this family and the idea of Matthew Sr. just, God, being locked up in his mental state and for 15 years. Yeah, this family's dealing there and with Think a about lot. this, unable to do anything and how that has affected the rest of them. It's, it's heartbreaking. I just, my heart truly goes out to them. It's horrible. But that's going to wrap it up for us today. Again, let us know your thoughts and comments. All the links from that we mentioned in the episode will be linked below for you. And definitely show this family some support. Yeah. I'm sure they need it. You know, even some kind words. And Oh, it goes such sure. a long way. Absolutely. It really does. Just take that moment to um, let them know you're thinking of them or share this episode or any coverage on his case or even a picture, his flyer, anything. Absolutely. It really goes a long way. Well, we'll see you guys next time. 